I'm always excited to be able to fill the pulpit, and and I'm excited about this morning. We're going to spend most of our time this morning in Acts chapter 2. So if you'll take out your Bible and begin to work your way there, we're going to land in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. But to get there, we're going to hit just a few high points um, to get where we're going. This summer, we... The student ministry has taken a look at the early church. We've been meeting in the upper room above the kitchen. So we've called them the upper room sessions. And we've really been focusing on the early church and just how God did work there. Now the important thing to realize is that the same God that that fueled the early church is the same God that fuels the church today. And somewhere between the early church and our modern church, we seem to have forgotten that. So we want to play a little catch up and... And, and kind of see what God did in the early church and maybe even try to figure out why we're not allowing him to do it today. So in Acts chapter 1, we're not going to read all of it. We're just going to hit a few high points throughout the, the first couple chapters to get us to where we want to be so that we can understand exactly what's happening. When you start the book of Acts, Luke writes to Theophilus, which the neat thing is, is in just glancing over this, you would think that Theophilus is probably a person. But when you look at the name Theophilus, it actually is, the, the name means the lovers of God. And so the neat thing is, is that Luke was so forward thinking that he knew one day that his gospel account and the acts of the apostles that we read here would actually be for the modern church, for us. So when Luke authors this letter and he says, in the first book, O Theophilus, he's talking to you and I as Christians today. It's neat to know that 2,000 years ago he was led by the Spirit enough to write you and I a book today. Just need to pick up there. Uh, But we see the last couple things that Jesus does on earth. In verses 4 and 5, and it's talking about Christ, it says, And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the, the first thing we see today is that Jesus Christ tells his disciples to stay in Jerusalem. He says, when I leave, don't run off. Because if you remember, right after the resurrection, what did the disciples do? They scattered. They went back to the things that they knew. Peter and Andrew and James and John went back to the Sea of Galilee and began to fish again. I'm sure Matthew was going back, checking on his tax collecting job, see if they could go back to the things that they had previously done. But here in Acts, he says, don't leave until the Holy Spirit comes. You know that John came and baptized with water, but I've been telling you, and John told you, and all the prophets of old told you that I was coming to baptize with the Holy Spirit. He says, so don't leave Jerusalem until you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, the early disciples didn't necessarily know what that meant, but they took Jesus at his word, and so they hung in there. Um, We see Christ's ascension in chapter 1, verse 8. Uh, Verse 7 leading into it, he said, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive the power from the Holy Spirit when he has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So the last thing that Christ tells them, again, he reminds them, Stay here, you're going to be empowered with the Holy Spirit, and when you do that, you're going to be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, which we know was there their starting point. That's where they were. They had to start being Christ's witness right where they were. And then Jesus said, then you go out a little bit further. Judea and Samaria were the surrounding areas. And then he capped it off by saying, even to the ends of the earth. So the neat thing for you and I today in that is that we have to understand that our first missionary location needs to be right out of those doors. The first place that we need to be Christ's witness is right through those doors. And then once we can witness here... Then we need to go out. Judea and Samaria would be like our county, our state. And then to the ends of the world would obviously encompass everywhere else. Further places in the U.S., um, international mission fields. Those are the places that we should reach once we start reaching right through those back doors. Sometimes we forget that that's a mission field too. There will be people drive by this church during this sermon this morning that are lost and going to hell. I I dare even to say it that there may be some in this room today that are lost. We need to first be witnesses right here. And then we can reach out to the rest of the world. The Acts chapter 1 continues on and we see the early church begin to form. and, And just some of the things that they were able to do are just simply amazing in my mind. 
chapter 12, we see that they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. See, when you, if you ever get the opportunity to go to Israel, I would strongly recommend it because it puts a passage like this in complete perspective. To be able to stand on the Mount of Olives and to know where history recognizes the upper room is a pretty decent walk. But it's, it's doable, right? A Sabbath day's journey. That was a length, of, a length that they could travel without working on the Sabbath day. And you know that Jews were very strict when it comes to their rules. And so it was, it was not that far of a walk. So they leave the Mount of Olives where Jesus ascended and back into heaven. They watch that whole thing go down. They see the angels come back to him and say, Men, why are you looking at the sky? We can promise you that when Jesus comes back, he's coming back in the same way. So go about your work, and when he comes back, you'll know it. And so they do. They travel back to Jerusalem, and verse 13 says, And when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. So he kind of gives a list there. They get back to the upper room, and it says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. And then it goes on into verse 15, spills over just a little bit. It says, In those days Peter stood up among the brothers. And this is the part that we have to understand here. The company of persons was in all about 120. So about 120 of Jesus' followers, the 12 or the 11 at this point, the 11 disciples go back to the upper room. Jesus' mother, some of the women that follow Jesus that are more notable, that are, are named there, all go back to the upper room. But also, all together, about 120 of them go to this upper room. Now the neat thing, if you ever get to tour Israel, is you go some places and you know for 100% fact that this is where something happened. Now other places are not so 100%. They're um, speculated. This is where history has recognized this place to be. So when you tour Jerusalem, you get to go to the upper room, and it's, a, it's not 100% sure, but that's where history speculates that the upper room would have been. And standing in that room, you have to realize that it's not even the size of our fellowship hall. Uh, it's a, if I had to describe it, it would be between the size of the youth room and the fellowship hall, somewhere right in between those two. So can you imagine being in that room with 120 people. Now, well, that's not a bad deal. We do that all the time. We have a fellowship. We'll easily have 120 people. You know, we all sit at the tables and we eat and it's good and we go home. But the thing is, we have to pick up um, and understand. Oh, it's just, it's too good. It's too good. Let's jump into chapter 2 and then we'll come back and touch on this a little more. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. See, this puts a, a timeline together for us. We, knew, we know that Jesus walked on earth for 40 days before his ascension. Pentecost uh, means 50 days. 50 days from what? Well, the Passover. If you remember, that's when Jesus was crucified. So Jesus ascended at 40 days. And then in chapter 2, we see that the early church is still gathered on Pentecost. Now, I went to Bradley, which is not the greatest school district, but they taught me basic math, and that gives me 10 days. For 10 days, 120 people were in a room between the size of our youth room and our fellowship hall. So not that big of a room for 120 people to be for 10 days. Can you imagine, if, if I had to just guess off the top of my head, there's probably 150 of you sitting in here today. Can you imagine if all 150 of us had to be in this room together for 10 days? Tensions might begin to run a little bit high, wouldn't you think? The first day or two, we'd probably be okay. But then these teenage boys up here would start stinking, and it would really begin. Hey, I'm just, I'm just speaking the truth. I mean, I was a teenage boy once. I know how they smell. So we would, we would begin to rub on one another, and it would begin to be tough for us to be in this room for 10 days. But the beautiful picture here that we see about the early church is it says that they were there for 10 days, and they were in one accord devoting themselves to prayer. Can you imagine if we stayed in this room for 10 days and we prayed for 10 days? One of my favorite things to do is when I meet older preachers or older evangelists, men that have really strived to serve the Lord with their entire life, is I try to get them and ask them one question. And the question is always the same. If you could go back and tell your younger self, Something, what would you tell yourself? 
And the answer is, it never fails. Unanimously across the board, the answer is always, I would tell myself to spend more time in prayer. And it amazes me that we look at the early church and they devoted themselves to prayer for 10 days. But in our modern church, prayer is one of the last things that we do. And it's usually short. You know, if somebody prays for two or three minutes, it starts to begin to get awkward. And we're like, well, they really need to wrap that up. They're kind of rambling on there. But these guys prayed for 10 days. I can't imagine how that brought them together as a body of believers. They stay in the upper room until Pentecost. In chapter 2, verse 1, we see that. In verse 2, it says, And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And it divided tongues as of fire and appeared to them and rested on each and every one of them. This is the coming of the Holy Spirit. So 120 people are in this room and they, the walls start shaking. And it says it sounds like a mighty rushing wind. And then it just busts into the room. And it's not actual fire. It's not, it's not going to set them on fire. It's not going to set the building on fire. Because Luke, being a doctor, was a smart man. And so he uses his words very carefully. And he says here, it appeared... As fire. Not that it was fire, but it was as fire. So that he didn't know what it was, but the closest thing he could come up with that it looked like was fire. And so he, he says that it comes and it rests on each one of them, and they were filled with the Spirit. In verse 4, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak other tongues as the spirits gave them utterance. Don't be confused here. That word tongues is not some garble. That word in the Greek is uh, glossé which is where we get the term glossary from. This was other languages. The Holy Spirit was empowering them to speak in languages that they did not know. And in verse 5 through the rest of chapter 2, those early disciples go out and they speak in other languages. And that very first day, that day of Pentecost, they preach a sermon. Peter heads a sermon up and he's speaking and people are hearing their language. Peter's preaching just like I would be preaching today. But if there were Spanish-speaking people over here, they'd be hearing Spanish. If there were Italian people back there, they'd hear Italian, Chinese, Russian, whatever it was. God was empowering his voice to break up and to go into many languages. And that's what was happening on the day of Pentecost. Not, not ramble, but known languages to people who were present to hear it. And so we see in the rest of chapter 2, like I said, they're, they're really on fire for the Lord here. Peter preaches the first sermon that I would, I would call it the first Christian sermon. After Christ's resurrection, this is the first sermon. And he preaches a strong sermon, and he just lays into it. And the beautiful thing is, is that he preaches the truth. And that truth, I'm sure it offended some, but it reached more than it offended. In verse 41 of chapter 2, we see that it says... So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So the first Christian sermon post-Jesus is preached, and 3,000 people repent and get saved and are baptized that day. I can imagine when Peter went to bed that night, he was pretty tired. He had, he had just preached the first sermon, the first Christian sermon, then baptized 3,000 people. That would get tiring after a while because inevitably somebody would have been like me. Not all of them were built like Tyler, little guys. Some of them would have been big guys. And that gets tiring after a while, you know, putting them big guys on the water, bringing them back up. Peter was a tired guy at the end of that day. But it was an amazing day. 3,000 people come to know the Lord after uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit and Peter, Peter preaching that word. So it leads us to the end of chapter 2, and this is where we're going to focus this is the first summary of the early church that we received from Luke. And uh, if you don't mind, stand with me. We'll read through it together. We'll ask God to bless it. And then we're going to dig in to these last couple verses of Acts chapter 2. He says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing them the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Father, we come to you this morning 
And we're so thankful to be able to come and to stand in your house. Lord, as we look at Acts chapter 2, God, I pray that we would find truth there, truth that would change us as individuals, truth that would change us as a body of believers. God, truth that would ultimately draw us closer to you in everything that we do. Lord, we thank you for the example of the Holy Church, and we know and trust that you're the same God then as you are today, and we just pray that we can find strength in your word. We love you. We ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, the first summary of the early church. If I were to to give this passage of Scripture and and our sermon today a name, I would call it Then and Now. Because what we're going to try to do this morning is to walk through these verses and see what the church did then and what our church does now. Not just our church, not just Three Creeks Baptist Church, but the church as a whole, the body of believers in our country and other locations around the world. These verses, these six verses, I would say are broken into three parts. Verses 42 and 43, 44 and 45, and 46 and 47. And, and each one speaks to a different thing. And so it's really neat to see how this summary adds up. Verse 42 and 43, I would say, speak to the spiritual health and condition of the early church. Verse 42 says, they, were devoted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and that's the first point, is they devote themselves to teaching. It's a struggle for many Christians in today's world to really devote themselves to God's teaching, whether it's just coming to church on a regular basis or maybe it's personal devotions or whatever it is. We struggle as a church, as a body of believers, to be devoted to God's teaching. And the question is why? If they made time for it then, Why don't we make time for it now? Well, we're busy. How many of you have said just in this past week that I'm busy? We are a busy people nowadays. Whether it's meaningless little something just to to buy our time, or maybe it is something big in our eyes. We are a busy people. But first and foremost, we have to realize that, that we can do nothing. We cannot do Uh, We cannot be the witnesses that God's called us to do if we allow ourselves to be so busy that we can't devote ourselves to God's teaching. That's the first thing that the early church did. That's what spoke the most about their spiritual health was that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. The apostles taught the Old Testament to them. The apostles taught the things that Christ had taught to them. God was speaking to them at that time and they were teaching those things. We as a church have allowed ourselves to become too busy to take care of our primary spiritual health indicator. We don't have time for God. We fill it with everything else. And we'll never, never, never reach the level that the early church reached until we take care of that thing. Until we devote ourselves back to the teaching of God and His Word. The second thing that we see in verse 42 is that they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. And then he, he tells us what he means by fellowship. The breaking of bread. I'm going to give it to us, church. That's the thing that we've got down. We know how to eat. We, we have got that one down. There's a lot of things that we've lost from the early church. But in 2,000 years, we have perfected the, the potluck fellowship. We have got that one down pat. So there's not even much I can say about that because when it comes to eating, uh, this church stands out among many. Uh, We have got some amazing cooks in this church, and praise God for that. I am enjoying that. Um, We've got that one down. They devoted themselves to teaching. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They spent time with one another. Um, They they ate together. That's good. We've, We've got that one. Then the third thing that we see in verse 42 is... Not only did they devote themselves to teaching and to fellowship, but they also devoted themselves to prayer. We don't have that one down so much. When's the last time as a church we spent 10 days together and prayed for 10 days? When's the last time we got together and prayed for an hour together? It's been a while. And I I hate to say this, but this is the world that we live in, that when we do get together and pray for one another, sometimes it turns into more gossiping than it does prayer. Oh, well, did you hear about so-and-so? No, I didn't. What's wrong? Well, you know, they're doing this, this, and this, and this, and because of all that, it's landed them here. 
Well, couldn't we just say they're having hard times and they need to be prayed for? We don't have to know the details because odds are somewhere in those details we've messed it up and we've went from sharing and, and picking up the burden for our brothers and sisters in Christ and we've left that behind and now we're just gossiping. We may have got pretty good at that one too and we need to get ungood at it pretty quick. Gossip is the single thing that will tear churches apart quicker than anything else that Satan has in his arsenal. We love to gossip. And Satan loves for us to gossip. But that is something that the early church, I'm sure they struggled with it like anybody, but it wasn't a forte of their characteristics. We need to forget how to gossip. You need to stand up when someone comes to you with gossip and say, I'm not hearing it. I'm not having it. You need to stop. Moving on into verse 43. This is a really neat verse that speaks to the spiritual things that God was doing at this time. And it says, And awe came upon every soul. And why did awe come upon every soul? It says, And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. You see, the word awesome, the word awe and awesome, were created specifically to describe God. It bugs me to no end when I hear students and children, even adults, throwing the world the word awesome out there. Oh, we went to the new Bass Pro Shop. It was awesome. No, don't get me wrong. I love Bass Pro Shop as much as anybody. I can promise you that. But Bass Pro Shop is not awesome. You go and you see the latest movie. That movie could be good, but it can't be awesome. You can watch a sunrise, and that can be awesome. You can spend time in God's Word, and that can be awesome. You can worship with a body of believers, and that can be awesome. Because it's of God. That word is God's word. Awe and awesome were created to describe God. Not a movie. Not a new restaurant. Nothing like that. Created to describe God alone. Think about that next time you throw the word awesome out there. Are you watching a sunset? Are you listening to God's creation around you? Are you spending time in His word? Those are awesome events. But a good burger is not an awesome burger. It's a good burger. Verse 43. The apostles are doing wonderful miracles. And it's putting people in a state of awe around Jerusalem. It's a great time. Moving to verses 44 and 45. We see that these two verses speak to the physical and the social aspects of the early church. Verse 44 starts off and says, And all who believed were together and had all things in common. That is a powerful statement right there. You've got at least 3,120 followers of Christ at this time. We had the 120 that were in the upper room. We had the 3,000 that accepted Christ at Peter's sermon. So there's at least 3,120 Christians at this time, followers of Jesus Christ. And it says that all 3,120 of them had all things in common. Do you know what that means? That they didn't fuss about the color of the carpet wherever it was they were. They didn't fuss about the type of music that they were worshiping with. They had all things in common. If we did a then and now for the early church and the modern church, it would be very easy to see that then they let the little details be little details and didn't make mountains out of molehills. And we do that, don't we? Well, did you see what they did up there? I can't believe they did that. You know what? Yeah, they raised their hands and worshipped. Maybe that's not your cup of tea, but maybe that's how they connect best with the Lord. Let the little details be little details. We have to get back to a point where we can be okay with not everything being our way. I don't know when it happened in the history of the church that we went from having all things in common to having to have things our way all the time. You see, a relationship with anybody, whether it's a husband and a wife or our best friends or a brother and sister or our mom and and, and her children, it doesn't matter. At some point, it's got to be give and take. Well, you know what? I'm not a, a fan of that music you're listening to, but it honors God. And even though it's not my favorite... If you like it and it's bringing God glory, I can let that alone. And we can have that in common. That that's your type of music and I'm okay with it because it honors God and we can leave it be. We don't have to force something on somebody just because it's not the way we want it. 
Sometime between the early church and the modern church, we have become selfish. We have to realize that we don't always need it our way. It's okay to have things in common with other people and let, let the little things be little. I remember when I was probably in the seventh grade, my dad bought me one of those feel-good types, type of books, and it was called Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. Maybe you've heard of it, maybe you hadn't, but I read that book, and it was, it was eye-opening, but for a teenager who thought he knew everything, uh, I thought, well, this book is garbage because, to me, this is big stuff, and it's not little stuff, and if he were smarter, he'd know that what's big stuff to me is big stuff to everybody. But then you grow up, and you, you get a little wiser, and you realize that we have to be willing to let go of the little things so that we can have a common um, thought process, a common heart about us. The second aspect, the second verse in the social health, the physical health of the early church was that it says in verse 45, they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing all the proceeds uh, as any had need. Now, there are some people that look at this verse and say, well, you know what, the early church was communism. They were living in a commune that they sold off everything they had and, and they just lived together and, and it was just kind of some weird little commune. That is the furthest thing from the truth um, because we have to look at the Scripture as a whole. Anybody that takes one verse out and says, well, look at this verse and doesn't look at the context of the verse is doing Scripture and injustice and, and we shouldn't stand for it. So when you look at this passage and it says, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. That verse should bring us great encouragement, but it should also bring us great challenge. You see, um, let's skip ahead just a little bit in verse 46. I just want you to see three words there. If you skip uh, almost to the end of verse 46, you'll see three words. It says, in their homes. Three words there that let us know that this was not a commune. This was not communism. This was people helping people. This is a uh, Three Creeks Baptist Church is the third church that I've ever served at. I was at Bradley Baptist, I was at First Baptist Old City, and now the Lord has brought us here. And I can say with complete honesty in my heart that this is the most giving church that Ash and I have ever been part of. It is something that, that we do very well in the big things. But we have to also understand that sometimes there are little needs that we sometimes overlook. We have to get away from the American dream we have to get back to the early church. I'm not saying that it's wrong to have things. Having things is great. God has blessed many of us with many things. But there is a line of excess. And when you cross that line of excess, you need to realize that God could do better things with your excess than you can do with, with what you have. I hope you hear my heart here. I'm not, I'm not saying not to have stuff. I'm saying that there's a line. And you, as an individual, have to find that line in your life. I can't tell you what it is. I know what it is for me and my family, but your family can be completely different. But for each and every one of us, there is that line, and you have to know where that line is. Funny how God works details out. This morning we talked about coveting in Sunday school and how this ties into the early church. The early church didn't struggle quite as much with coveting as we do today. We talked about keeping up with the Joneses and, and, and feeling like we had to have the newest and the nicest of all things. Um, that's part of a lie that our culture has fed us, that we as Americans have to chase the American dream at all costs. But in reality, we don't. We need to chase Jesus Christ at all costs. And so we see that the, the physical and the social health of the early church thrived because they took care of one another. They got rid of the excess, but because of those three words in verse 46, in their homes, we know that they didn't sell everything they had. I don't want you to turn and to sell your home and your cars and your clothes and, and walk down the street with one pair of clothes to, to be all that you own. That's not what God's calling you to here. He's given us things, and we should be good stewards of them. But you've got to find that line of excess in your life, and you've got to be able to, to understand. You've got to be content, like we talked about in Sunday school this morning. Contentment in God is a great thing. Discontentment with the world's desires is a scary thing. Verse 46 and 47 is part three of this summary of the, the early church. And this is the part that I think should apply most to you and I in here today because it is the keys to achieve the, the status of the early church. It's the keys to achieve the productivity of the early church. We see three things in part three. 
Verse 46 says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. If you are a note taker, you want to underline that in your Bible and you want to point out the first thing that the early church did to thrive was they lived life together. They weren't a bunch of individual families who come together once a week and all sit in a room and listen to the same preacher and then they left and never saw one another again. They lived their lives together. They were always, they, they worshipped together. They went to the church and, and were taught together. They went to, they went and did life together. When one kid was sick, they went and checked on the kid. When one person was down and out, they went and tried to cheer him up. They lived their lives together. Some of us do that. We, we have little cliques in churches. And that little clique does things together. And that little clique does things together. But, but that's not what we're talking about here. All believers had all things in common. They lived their lives together. We've got to get back to that. Where... Paul talks about it in one of his letters. When one part of the body hurts, the whole body hurts. When one of us is struggling through a a time of loss, then all of us need to struggle with that person through a time of loss. We need to be willing to support one another and live life together. The second point that we see in part three, it says, Praising God. They worshiped. Together. Now, I'm not saying that they gathered together once a week and had a song service, but they worshiped together. You know that worship is a lifestyle. It's not a 20-minute segment of, of a Sunday morning service. Worship is a lifestyle. They lived life together. They lived a life of worship together. In all things, they worshiped. It's like we talked about earlier. When they saw a sunset They were in awe and they worshiped God together. I wonder if we ever worship together. I know we gather and we sing together. But I wonder if we truly get together and we worship. Do we empty our hearts and our minds and let God fill us? And let just the joy that fills up inside of us just spill out. That's what worship is. Godly joy spilling out of us and giving glory back to God. I wonder if we ever truly do that. I wonder if the American church even knows how to worship anymore. I know there there are individuals who worship. But I wonder as a body of believers, this Sunday morning across this United States, I wonder how many churches are truly worshiping. I wonder if what we've done here this morning is truly worshiping God. The third thing that we see in verse 47, the third point that, that is the key to understanding the success of the early church is, is, man, this is kind of a punch in the gut. It says, and having favor with all the people. Now, what does that mean for you and I today? Having, I struggle with this. I, I honestly struggle with this because as a church, we need to find favor with people around us. Are you known for being fair in your dealings with others? Are you known for for stopping and helping someone in need? Are you known for trying to skim a little off the top? Because the way that we find favor with one another as believers and as non-believers in the world around us is to treat them like we want them to treat us. Funny, it seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Do you find favor with the world around you? I'm not saying are you a socialite, are you popular, because that's not what it means here. But to find favor in the people around us means that they respect us because our word is truth. When you tell somebody, yes, I'll do that, then you do that. When you tell somebody, you know, no, I can't do that, then you don't go behind their backs and do it anyway. When you tell somebody that this is how it's going to be, that's how it is. Do you find favor with people? Because the favor, this is the key that really unlocks ministry for you and I in the world today. If you don't find favor in people's eyes, you can never tell them about Jesus Christ. How can I expect you as a congregation to believe anything I say if you know that I'm a liar? 
if I go around and I lie to many of you throughout, uh, throughout the church, I know that, that we, like most churches, are good at gossiping. So if I begin to lie to groups of you, everybody will know that I'm a liar. Then how can I stand here and proclaim truth if I've lost favor in your eyes? Now, it's easy to, to use a preacher as an example because he's the one that's supposed to be up in front of everybody and to, to be on this pedestal, so to speak, and we expect more things out of him than we do other people. But in reality, that preacher is still just a Christian. And you know what you are? You're a Christian. So the favor that you expect the preacher to hold with people should be the same favor that you hold with people. Why? Because when Christ said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, He didn't just speak to just those 11 disciples that were there. He spoke to you and I. Remember, Luke wrote this book to Theophilus, the lovers of God, the Christians of today. So when Christ said, go to Jerusalem and then to Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth, He was speaking to you and I. The way that we are Christ's witnesses in the world around us is by finding favor with man. They know that our word is true. And so if we go to them and we begin to speak the truth of Jesus Christ, they're going to say, you know what? This man has never lied to me about anything to my knowledge. So why would he come to me and lie about this guy, Jesus Christ? You have got to live your life in such a way that when people look at you, they know that what they see is what they get. The early church found favor in the world around them. I wonder if we begin to seek out God and to find favor in men around us, would we not receive the same blessing that the early church did? Because when you add living life together with worshiping together and finding favor and witnessing to the men and women around us, what does that equal? This is a little math equation. One, two, three, the three points all equal the end of verse 47. And it says, The Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Our church is an anomaly. We're not the norm. We baptized, just a few weeks ago, we baptized people three weeks in a row. Many of you don't, many of you are faithful to this church, and very rarely do you go to another church. But like I've said, I've been to different churches I've been around in the last several years, and I can promise you one thing. Most churches are not baptizing people three weeks in a row because they're not seeing people saved. They're not experiencing a move of God in their people. And that should be heartbreaking for us, even sitting here in three years. We can't just sit here and say, well, God's moving here and we're glad for it. We've got to be willing to say, my heart breaks because, yes, God is moving here, but He's not moving everywhere. Your heart needs to break for that. You need to do your part to find favor with men so that you can go and help God move in other places. He doesn't need your help. He wants you to help. I wonder if we live life together, if we truly worshiped together, and we found favor in the world around us, would God not add to our numbers every day? That's what His Word says. That's what God would do. I wonder what aspect of these three points, the, the keys to achieve the success of the early church, I wonder what point sticks out the most to you. I wonder, is it you don't want to live life with people here in this church? And I wonder, if you don't want to, I wonder why. Because if, if you don't, then it's got to go back to the root that you don't have all things in common. We can be different people, but we need to have our fundamentals in common. I wonder if it's you don't know how to worship. Now, I'm not saying none of you know how to sing. Some of you sing much better than others, and I fall on the other side of that spectrum. But that's okay. Singing and worship don't have to go together because the, the wretched noise that is produced when I open my mouth and try to sing is still worship. Right? And the same can be true for you. You don't have to be a great singer to be a good worshiper. I wonder if you struggle in worshiping God. I wonder if you've lived your life in such a way that you have lost favor with the men around us. I wonder if your reputation precedes you in, that in, in not a good way. That people know when you're coming that you're going to be looking for a way that you can make a few extra bucks and cheat them out of a few extra bucks. I wonder if, if women know that if they share something with you that you're going to spread it to every woman that you come in contact with. I wonder uh, if young people... if if everybody at school 
knows that when you're at church, you're a Christian, but when you're at school, you're not. Because if that's the reputation that precedes you, you do not have favor in man's eyes. And if we take out any one of those three elements of the early church, the whole equation crumbles. We need to evaluate ourselves. You need to dig down deep and ask yourself the question. I can't answer it for you. But you need to ask yourself the question, which one of those three aspects am I neglecting? Am I fulfilling my part of the church, of the body of believers, in living my life with other believers, studying God's Word together, breaking bread together, living life with other believers? Am I living a life of worship, standing in awe of God? Or have I lost favor because of my actions? I wonder which one of those hits home the most with you today. I'm going to ask our worship team to come this morning. And as we go into a time of invitation, I, I hope that you will reflect on those three things and ask yourself, God, open my eyes so that I can see where it is that I can serve you better. Open my eyes so that I can see where I'm neglecting you the most. And I hope that you do business with God this morning. You don't have to come down front. These altars are open if you want to. They're here. You're more than welcome to come and do business with God. But you can do business with God right where you're at. Say, God, open my eyes. Show me where I'm lacking. And then when God shows you, because He will, be willing to change and be willing to reach the potential that God wants us to be at. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. We're so thankful for your truth. We're so thankful for your word. God, I thank you for the example of the early church and how they, they devoted themselves to your teaching. They, they lived their lives together. They truly worshiped you, God. And Lord, they had favor in man's eyes so that they could go out and be your witnesses in all places. Lord, I just pray that this morning as, as your Holy Spirit moves in and amongst your people, God, that you would begin to convict each and every one of us of where we're falling short in this equation. God, that you would show us, you know what? Your word isn't as good as it used to be. You need to work on that so that you can find favor among men again. Or God, maybe we're not, being, uh, we're not wanting to plug into a body of believers and live life shoulder to shoulder with other followers of Christ. God, maybe we need to, to join this church and, and say wholeheartedly that we're part of this body and we're going to live life right here where you've planted us. Lord, maybe we need to devote ourselves back to your teaching so that we can dig into your word and hear from you on a daily basis. God, maybe we need to back up and reevaluate what we call worship. Lord, maybe we need to spend some time in quiet. No singing, no music, no, no any of that. But God, we need to listen for your voice because your voice is what fills us with joy and true worship, Lord, is an overflowing of the joy that you've placed in our life. Lord, I pray that you would deal with each and every one of us on whatever aspect of our life is lacking. God, you would call us to repentance. And then as we repent as a body, that you would be most glorified through that. Lord, that you would, you would keep your promises as you always do. And when we work as a body of believers, God, that you would add to our numbers daily. That we would see people continue to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and be baptized and just to be on fire and plugged in for you, God. We're so thankful that you're the same God today as you were for the early church. Lord, I just pray that you would continue to bless this body of believers. Lord, be with us. Move during this time of invitation. Allow people to do work with you. Lord, if there's one here who's never accepted Jesus Christ, let today be the day. They say, I want to start this relationship with Jesus so that I can be part of what God is doing. Father, we love you. We pray that you would bless us. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.